Welcome to the No Shame Podcast. This is John Groders. Today's guest has cracked open something so foundational to the founding of America, I can't believe I've never heard it before, but I can almost guarantee you've never heard it either. Take out a dollar bill, look at the back side of it, and then listen to this week's edition to No Shame with our guest, Michael Canis. No shame. Welcome to the No Shame Podcast. John Groder's here on the floor of the National Religious Broadcasters. And this guest is Michael Canis. And this is kind of bizarre because what happened today is I met Michael and I found out we're neighbors. Exactly. And we met in Anaheim. But um, I live in Holland, Michigan. Been living in Holland, Michigan for 30 years. How about you? Um, let's see. My son's 19 and we moved when he... Tina was pregnant with him, so 19 plus years. It's a fairly small town if you've never been to Holland, Michigan, and the fact that we've never met each other is inexcusable because Michael's new book is the exactly the kind of thing that I am so interested in. And the book is called The Hidden Message of the Great Seal. Let's dive right in. What's the Great Seal we're talking about? Okay, so a, a quick way that uh, listeners can see what the seal looks like is if they can get a hold of a dollar bill. Which is hard to do these days. <laughs> yeah, really, nobody uses cash. But a cash. one dollar bill. Right. Uh -huh. right take a one out. If you're driving right now, take out a dollar bill. If you're cooking in the kitchen, go ahead and rob the cradle. Get the dollar bill from your children who still have them. <laughs> Look at it. What are we looking at? I'm going to well, get one out. Yeah, okay, good. And so there's two circles on there. Uh, one of them has an eagle. And it has a banner in its beak. Uh, it says E Pluribus Unum on there. And then below that, uh, well, the, in the eagle's talons, uh, there's an olive branch and some arrows. And so that's that's on one side. And then on the other side, there, <laughs> he's getting on the dollar I found bill. it. Is this a hundred? Oh, no, it's a one. Never mind. I got what you need. Never okay. sure in my wallet. Ha, <laughs> <laughs> that's a joke. Yeah. And then the other side is a pyramid. Uh, with an eye over the top, and then the phrase Anuit Coeptus over that, and then below it is the phrase Novus Ordo Seclorum. He's doing this without looking at the dollar bill, by the way. <laughs> He's an expert. Yeah. And so, well, one of the Anuit things... Anuit Coeptus on the top, Yeah. and Novus... Say that again. Novus Ordo Seclorum. This is on our money, everybody. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay, all right, mm -hmm. I'm looking and at so, it. And uh, so, we'll just start with that, that pyramid there. And the, the first thing is that... Oh, and by looks... the way, it says the Great Seal right under that. In case you think he's pulling one over on you, <laughs> I'm just validating because this is audio. <laughs> I'm looking at the dollar bill, and there, it, this is the Great Seal. It's that pyramid, you all know it, with the detached eye. Okay, so yeah. carry on, sorry. Okay, okay. So, well, here you have this sort of enigmatic-looking image there with this eye, and, you know, we... we tend to think that it's the all-seeing eye or the eye of Horus. And, and so all these sort of theories come rushing in to fill the void of what does that mean in the absence of having some substantive... Horus, the Greek god of uh, the... Yes, Egyptian. That's, that's always... Yep. What, uh, Greek, I said Greek. Yes, yep. the Egyptian god, Horus, mm -hmm. with the... Is he the jackal? Uh, boy, not He's even sure. He's one of those sure. Egyptian gods, but mm -hmm. okay, that's right. We've been told these kind of spooky things. Mm -hmm. All right, mm -hmm. all right. And even that phrase underneath where, you know, it's sort of seen as being this sinister new world order, Novus Ordo Seclorum, and, you know, it's kind of Bilderberg or something like, like that. I feel like chanting it right now, <laughs> yes. <laughs> right, right, Novus right. Ordo Seclorum. Okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so, you know, we have all these notions and images. Well, right now, just blow them up. Just everything that you think you know about the seal, just forget it, because it's all wrong. And the, the amazing fact is that if you were able to pick up a copy of the book and read, you will learn things about the seal that have, in my knowledge, not been discussed before, not been revealed. In 237 years, we did not know our seal. And, and I, I, I mean, I'm going to use the word I discovered it. And mm. so the, the way that the, the book is, is written is it presents the evidence. It shows you pictures, 295 pictures in the book, and it walks you through you know why how could it have been hidden for so long and you know what were the what's the evidence and so it walks through and explains those things so um, going back to the the um, 
of the, that pyramid and the, and the enigmatic eye, well, how do we know that that isn't the eye of Horus, for example? Well, there it is in the congressional record, June 20, 1782, uh, written in the hand of Charles Thompson, the Secretary of Congress. It directly says the, the eye is the eye of providence. And he is in, uh, working in favor of the American cause. So, boom, right away, we can just put those theories aside because it, they're wrong. It, Congress said so. They ratified that report. Now, let me just be careful we don't go too fast here because okay. what you just said is actually extremely important. If I were to bring on a scholar who had the ability to tell us what an ancient seal meant and it was you know, the author's Aunt Mary's favorite apple pie recipe or something, mm -hmm. it would be interesting but insignificant. Right. The reason this has caught my attention when we talked earlier today mm -hmm. is as we are looking at the state of our country today and as we are discussing the things that may or may not have been our founding principles, which are under assault one and all, mm -hmm. this goes back, as you just said, to 1782. Mm -hmm. And, and they were then designing the Great Seal. Yeah. And so these are the founders. You have, you've shown me this man, Charles Thompson, who was one of the great American patriots, one of the long-time congressmen, figure. a leader mm -hmm. in the early... So this is not, again, some little offshoot art department from Chesapeake. Right. We're talking about the center of the American government mm -hmm. deciding what the country is going to be known for mm -hmm. graphically. Right. And, and icons are so important. Because why? Tell me why. Okay. Well, in this case, um, so the same three people that designed the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, and Benjamin Franklin, um, also were signers of the Declaration of Independence, as well as other designers that worked on the seal also signed the Declaration of Independence. Uh, what they did, Congress, by choosing them, uh, expressed a desire because it was the same day, July 4, 1776, the day that the Declaration of Independence was ratified. That was at 2 p.m. At 5 p.m., one of the first acts of the new Congress was to pass a resolution calling for the seal. No kidding. Yeah. And so if they just wanted to be a couple pictures, they'd say, hey, raise your hands. Uh, who can draw? Yeah, who wants you know, a chicken? <laughs> who wants a hawk? Okay. Who, you know, just uh, we need somebody that can put a logo for, together for us, you know, $30 logo. No, they picked these guys because they wanted it to be the same. They wanted to be congruous. They wanted it to have the same meaning. Wow. Powerful. Wow. Now, again, you mentioned this a minute ago, but I want to just reiterate the pyramid. And we're just talking about one thing, or the Great Seal. The pyramid on your dollar bill. This is what the Charles Thompson Sr. in 1782 wrote about, that the pyramid on the reverse signifies strength and duration. The eye over it and the motto alluded to the many signal interpositions of providence in favor of the American cause. He was right talking on. about God. Absolutely, no in doubt about it. In favor of the American cause. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This wasn't an obscure religious perspective that was only for the Jesus people of the day. This was the bedrock of the American experiment. Absolutely. And it's right here in the middle of the seal, 250 years later. Absolutely. And, and so while there, we are blessed to have that report that gives us an indication of what things are and what it's not, the, the report doesn't give us the full explanation. Right. So th that's left up to us to explore and to research and to dig into it. And so that begins sort of this odyssey of discovery where it goes from, you know, all these different places and times in history. It looks at different coins and currencies and, and, and we really get to know some of the founders that were involved in the designing of the seal, like Francis Hopkinson and Charles Thompson. We hear their stories and we find out what makes them tick. And what we have is this six-year period of time, four different committees that the seal was designed over. You have the first committee that I just mentioned, the, the three, and they met together right away uh, in, in 1776 to talk about how are we going to do this. They agreed together, and, and there's evidence uh, of it, that they were going to write an allegorical message. And an allegory is a story told with symbols. So it can either be in, in um, 
words, like Pilgrim's Progress. We're uh, sitting here in front of the Pilgrim's Progress uh, van. Uh, so that was an allegory that right. people might right. be John promoted. Bunyan's novel, yes. Right. Okay. But then it can also be told with symbols. Okay. So our seal is an allegory told with symbols. And so the, the journey of discovery uh, in the book is deciphering the meanings, and I'm going to use a plural, of the seal because it's a deep. It's complicated. The book is 260 pages long with 295 images. So, so way back in the foundings of the country, they took things seriously. They took words seriously. Mm-hmm. The handwriting, which is in the original hand, they, they weren't, there weren't typewriters and word processors. Uh, it, it was painstaking to write these words, and yet we've read the letters of John Jay and of Madison and the Pentagon Papers. I mean, such literate men of their day, such enlightened men who are coming through these revivals, and now they're taking time to think carefully about the icons that will define the country. They want them to endure. You say they want them to have allegorical meaning, which good stories should always have. Mm -hmm. And they've put, you said not one, not two, not three, but four different gatherings together? Yeah, there's, okay, so the there's sort of four themes in that allegorical message that run through the seal. And the themes are virtue, providence, or faith in God, freedom, and unity. And so they used these different symbols, um, and, it, and the, when I mm. interpret the message, um, it does get a little... Um, complicated because there's all these different things that are all stuck together and there's 18 different symbols in there and they're all um, woven together in in a certain way but those four pillars are sort of the the core of the message and then there's there's four I'll call them essays in the book on each one of those that really explains the function and the importance of them say them again the four pillars it's freedom freedom providence or providence of the Lord faith in God uh, virtue and means virtue, righteousness, or the way to be, and then unity. Unity, mm-hmm. freedom, providence, virtue, and unity. Mm-hmm. If we just pause for a moment and just ask ourselves the question: Were they right? Were those four good th- pillars to try to build a country on? Oh my gosh! Just, just okay. I love the word that you just used, John. Pause, because let's pause and think about those four things. Mm-hmm. Are there four things that are more under attack today? Amazing. Then, then faith in God. Amazing. That's, it's it's between the four inches between your ears. That's where you're allowed to have freedom of religion mm-hmm, almost. Mm-hmm, you know, right. you even hear stories about you, somebody wanted to have a Bible study in the in the public area of their condo complex and they couldn't do it wow. because you know that's oh that's an expression of religion and this is a public space. It was never meant to be like that, but it's right. under attack. Right. And then you think about freedom. Our freedoms are under attack. Like. Yep. I'm not experienced in my lifetime right. to think about having to have free speech zones right. where you can only talk freely in, in these few square feet and outside of that you, you can't say what you, what you believe and what you feel. Right. You know, ridiculous. You, you look at, um, you know, our, our, the Bill of Rights in, in, in the Constitution. You know, those freedoms, Second Amendment, and, you know, all these different freedoms that are under attack like never before. So that's, that's providence, uh, freedom. And then you think about virtue. Virtue. See, a virtue, there's, there's values and then there's virtue. Uh, values are just things that we think are important, okay? Those change. They're, they're, mm. they're different for right, different right. people, right? But virtue is unchanging, right. okay? And, and I define virtue as the character of God. Yep. So how is God, well, he's patient, he's loving, He's forgiving, he's merciful, he's kind, he's gracious. All those things would be considered virtues. And there's lots of different virtues, and, and they're expressed in different ways in the book. But um, those things don't change. And if you really think about what, what virtue um, is, when you think about those things that I just described, we don't differ on those, John. There is no variation. Who doesn't agree to be kind? Who doesn't agree to be loving and generous, right? Those are things that we can unify around. Mm -hmm. But that comes to the fourth point, that's unity. Mm. When we define ourselves by identity politics, if you want to call it that, by race or gender or sexual orientation or uh, ethnicity, or you just name it the way we define 
our identity, that is divisive by its very nature. No matter how much I want to, if, if you define something by gender, I'm not a woman. Some people <laughs> okay. have brown I'm eyes. Be... Some people have blue <laughs> right. eyes. Some people have I'm... green eyes. We're never going to get along. We're, yeah, I, I cannot be unified in that because I don't physically fit into that category. My goodness. And, and so, but if we, if we reject that notion and say, no, what do we value in common? What does it mean to be an American? It kind of goes back to those days when, you know, the comic books, you know, truth, justice in the American way. Mm -hmm. That, you know, there was the sense that we all shared the same values and we were all united around those. And, And the other things paled. Yes, there's differences. And yes, we have things that we need to work out. But those are the things that are important. And we're gonna love each other and not reject each other or hate each other because we have a different opinion about something because we hold those things in common. Heck, we're on the same team. Hmm. Hmm. Listen, if you're an American and you're listening to this podcast, and you might not be, the podcast can be picked up anywhere in the world. And in, in, in other countries, I don't understand as well. So I hope people will take the time to explore the, the historical foundations of, of their own countries, whatever they may be. But this particular country where I was born and, Michael, where you were born, you are drawing out of a, a, a symbol that is still, to this day, on our $1 bill. Mm-hmm. And from this symbol, you have extracted that our country was built on four foundational pillars, freedom, God, virtue, and unity. And you ask, are those not four all under attack today? Fantastic insight, right on the $1 bill. Right, exactly. You know, and and there's so many different elements to the seal. There's, it is so poetic, John. Once you begin to, to see it and understand it, Oh my gosh, the way the pieces fit together, it is elegant and beautiful and complex and amazing. And we had some of the most brilliant minds in the in the uh, 18th century that were working on the design of the seal. And one of them is this guy by the name of Charles Thompson. And um, I had a chance to, to share a little bit. You, you, you can just we can agree that he's an amazing character. We don't have time to talk about it well, now. Well, uh, Charles Thompson, just in brief, seems to be one of the intellectual giants of the late 18th century. He, mm-hmm. he had, as you have described to me, a photographic memory and, an, and, a, and a talent for everything. One, mm-hmm. one of these people. And then he was like the longest serving congressman. He mm-hmm. was the secretary of Congress. This, so we are talking about, you might not know the name Charles Thompson the way you might know the name Benjamin Franklin or James Monroe or George Washington, but he was in the company of those men Absolutely. for sure. Okay. Knew Charles them Thompson. all personally. He's called the forgotten founding father. Okay, cool. But, well, one of his many giftings was he was an expert in, in languages, spoke mm. many different languages, expert in Latin, expert in Greek, in Hebrew, and he employed his knowledge of Latin to a very great degree. And he drew all the mottos from the, se- the seal, so e pluribus unum, anuit coeptus, and novus ordo seclorum, all from poems that were written by the Roman poet Virgil in around 40 to 50 BC. No yeah, they're all drawn from Virgil's poems, the three different poems. So, E Pluribus Unum is actually from a recipe for a kind of a spread that shepherds use called Moratum. That's the name of the poem. And it's, and it's not this notion of, um, you know, out of many one, meaning, you know, a bunch of different flowers bundled together into one, you know, uh, okay. flower arrangement bouquet. No, it's a, it's a recipe with garlic and oil and herbs, and, and you mash it all together, and they come from all these different parts, and they now become one expressive of a new identity and character and fragrant and, and beautiful and, and wonderful in their own right, even though they've come from all these different sources. So that's the kind of unity that they're talking about. And it's not a message about diversity. It's a be- message about what we have in common, the good, the best of all of us. And yes, there's differences and we brace those too, but we also recognize that it's important to seek unity and commonality, and that's the message of E Pluribus Unum. And then the other, Anuit Coeptus, this is an amazing phrase. It is a prayer. It, um, it comes from uh, the, the poem, um, the Aeneid, and it is um, a prayer uh, 
to, to Jupiter to guide the arrow. Aeneas is shooting an arrow. Um, and so, but the way that it, it gets interpreted into our seal, it becomes a statement. Charles Thompson converts it into a statement. And the statement says this, we, do, we have begun doing what pleases God. And the power of that statement, John, really, um, there's, there's two different kinds of law. There's, there's a law that's proscriptive, means it tells us what we can't do. And there's, you can only have so many of those because you have to police them, you have to enforce them. It takes you know, all layers of government and expense to try to force people to, to be a certain way, right? But then there's this other kind of law called prescriptive law. Okay, prescriptive law tells you what you should do. And it's more of an identity than it is a law. It tells you who you are. And once you know who you are, then you know how to behave. And you give expression to that identity in a positive way. And so here this phrase, it's saying, we do what pleases God. So all in this one phrase, it's a complete expression of governance. I don't need another law. I know in my heart how to behave, how to act. And in each instance, I don't need something written down. I have a witness inside of me. That's like the, the, the Bible says the kingdom is within you. It's an expression of a kingdom within. And so here we have this expression of proscriptive law, which is the quintessential expression of governance on the quintessential expression of government powerful, amazing thing. And then this last phrase... A new coeptus, which is the, the two words on the top of the circle above the pyramid, we have begun doing what pleases God. Absolutely. Oh my goodness. Can you imagine <laughs> oh. uh, how much trouble you'd get in if you said that's what our government is all about? Wow. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Okay, yeah. now there's this other phrase below in this yeah. sort of ribbon. Yes. And that is the... The other one. That's Novus Ordo Seclorum. And I just exactly. want to talk about that briefly. There's a really cool, interesting story that's Novus amazing. Novus Ordo Seclorum. Okay, right. right. It make you, you just, it's a, it's a co toe-curling story to, to, to tell you the whole thing. But I, I won't go into depth on that because it takes time. But I, I will tell you that um, this phrase, Novus Ordo Seclorum, is, it comes from one of Virgil's poems. This one is called the Eclogues. It comes from the fourth Eclogue, the fifth verse. Okay, and, and, and it, it's, a, it's a poem. So Virgil is talking about a poem. Okay, he's relating this poem. And it goes like this. Now is the final era of Sybil's song. The new order of the age is born afresh. Honored rule returns. Justice returns. A new lineage comes down from high heaven. The boy rules what once was iron in a new golden age. Mm. And you have to remember, Virgil is writing at the, the first time a Republican government was being attempted. Am I right? Yes. We're talking about a Roman. Roman this is before the battle that ultimately went in the case of the monarchy. But there was a time where Rome was meant to be governed in essentially a bicameral system, right? Yes. And, so and, and, that's and, why they go back to Virgil. Yeah, and we are all familiar with the Roman Senate and, yes. you know, that there's this this parallel model. And, and the, these are in the oh. twilight years of the Roman Republic. The Roman Republic lasted 500 years. And then and then uh, Caesar, uh, uh, Augustus, or I'm sorry, Julius Caesar, so, uh, pardon me for you history buffs out there, it was a slip of the tongue. Julius <laughs> Ju comes Ju first, Ju I remember Caesar, that. <laughs> Julius Caesar, um, uh, he uh, takes over the government. And, right. and, and he sets himself up as a dictator and then eventually is, That's is why murdered. He's murdered by right. his best friend Brutus, exactly. R right, so that brings an end to the Roman Republic. And he tried to reestablish the And the Virgil's Republic. right at that perimeter, isn't mm -hmm. he? Between those two yes. movements, mm -hmm. between the Republican Senate and what's going to become this cult of personality, Julius, and then Augustus, of course, is going to defeat. Brutus and Cassius at right. Philippi. Right. So interesting that that's where Charles Thompson goes back to the yes. last time they had to decide this. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And so here you have this, but, but think about that prophecy for just a minute, okay? It's a beginning, right? It's, it's talking about this new era. And so, you know, we've had people, you know, that would say, oh, Novus Ordo Seclorum, that's new order of the ages, that's the new world order, that's the Illuminati and all that. No. When you look at the context that it's come from, it's completely consistent with the other components of the seal. It couldn't mean that. 
look at the Anuit Coeptus means we do what pleases God. And, and in the book, and, and it's a fascinating story, I wish we could talk about it, the pyramid stands for virtue. Okay, it's got 13 rows. Okay, the 13 rows stands for the 13 colonies, but 13 also is the number of new beginnings. So 13 steps in creation. Um, a Jewish boy begins his manhood at age 13. Um, the, the, the word Bereshit, which is Genesis, which means beginning, has a value of 13. I mean, there's all this <laughs> sense that, that 13 is this number of new beginnings. Okay, so you have a, a thing that we've begun to do. We have a new beginning of virtue in the pyramid. And now we're talking about a new order of virtue. It all ties together and it's consistent and integrated and tightly woven. It is a thing of beauty, so exquisite. It's hard to express in a few words, but I can tell you that if you read, you just won't believe it. And it's all laid out for you to see for yourself. We're speaking with Michael Canis here on the No Shame Podcast, and his book is called The Hidden Message of the Great Seal. And uh, we're just cracking the surface of this. Tell me about the eye of the tiger there. The, okay. I remember the Alan Parsons project, and they had that on their cover. So what's the eye above the pyramid? Okay, that is a favorite of yeah. the conspiracy theorists. Oh, it's the Masons, yep. and yep. like you said earlier, it's Horus, uh, the Egyptian god. And absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Okay, so, so and, and we've already referred to the congressional report that, dis, that dispels that uh, theory. Uh, and so then we're left with, well, then what is it? Okay, mm -hmm. so we just said it's the eye of providence, but weird. Where did that thing come from? How right. come it looks like that? And what's the basis for it? Well, um, it is a symbol that is almost ubiquitous throughout Europe. If if you travel, if you go to Cologne Cathedral, if you go to um, Aachen Cathedral, if you go to um, Madeline, you know, all, all these different places, and you look, there's these symbols everywhere. And I've traced them back you know, through time, I've come up with them all the way back to as, as late as, or as early as 300 AD in, in a, in a, in a uh, church in Spain. But the point being is that it is expressive of a loving care of God, of providential protection. The triangle stands for the Trinity, and it, 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 in this sense, it is really refers to God the Father. Okay, so um, there's other expressions of it, and it typically is used in context with God the Father, although it can just mean the Trinity, but in this uh, context, it does mean God the Father. So you here have this radiant light that's uh, emanating from the oh, triangle. Oh, right. Look at that. It's yeah. glowing. I right. never noticed that before. Yeah, that's significant. Look at your dollars, everybody. There's mm. radiant light over the eye of providence. Look at that. Okay. Mm -hmm. good, and it's good. not an accident. It's in the report. Um, and so what that really is indicative of is the presence of God. Okay, now, th that's an interesting thing, John, because the presence of God it's not referring to the omnipresence of God, where God is everywhere, right? No, this is the kind of presence of God that only exists when what he favors, what he is pleased with. Okay, God says, don't touch what's unclean, and I will dwell with you, and I will walk with you, and you shall be for me a people. Touch not the unclean thing. What harmony have the temple of God with idols or Christ with Baliel? So it's this sense of when we do what's pleasing to God, we enjoy intimacy and fellowship and relationship with him. That's the meaning of that <laughs> glory that's emanating we from the presence. We call it the Shekinah glory exactly. of God. Sometimes it dwelled in the Holy of Holies, and everyone could see it. And Moses and Elijah and the Mount of Transfiguration come down with Jesus. They are said to have this around them, the Shekinah glory of God. Did you know that was on our dollar bill? It, it is. And if it's you knew, call me right now, because no one's going to call me. <laughs> No one of you is going to call who's listening to this podcast today with Michael Canis. Well, and I can, the other thing, um, there is a, a two reports. One is written in the hand of Thomas Jefferson, and it's his handwriting. And another is written in the handwriting of Benjamin Franklin. And it's describing a, a scene, it's the progenitor of this image. 
okay, so it's it's not the picture that's on the dollar bill, but it's the the first iteration of it. Okay, same message. Because they weren't working the, in Photoshop, they couldn't save these things digitally. They had to work these up a while, right? Well, and and this was you know uh, submitted to Congress multiple times. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the first version, even though it was submitted to Congress, it wasn't accepted, but it wasn't rejected either. Okay, and so they were in a sense saying, we like it, do more. C continue with it. It was called being continued. And that first image has the image of Moses standing on the shore of the Red Sea with a pillar of fire and a pillar of cloud the overhead. Shekinah glory, by glory, the way. Glory, rays of glory yep. shining down on Moses to indicate the divine presence yes. and command. Wow. It specifically says that. Yes. And so here we have this glory that was carried over. Now, if you flip the dollar bill, uh, you know, bring back the dollar bill, and you look on the other side, what do you see on the front? The cloud and the glory. What? Yeah. I don't it's, see it yet. Wait a minute. Where? It's around the stars. And that, oh my goodness! That image is actually not drawn entirely accurately on the dollar bill, because the glory extends over the whole scene. Mm. It is enveloping the eagle in the light of the glory. Okay, that's according to the congressional record. This actually isn't quite in, uh, drawn correctly, but it's taking the same meaning. It's a covenantal meaning, and it's the same on the front and the back of the seal. It's consistent. And what this cloud in this, this, the, this... You just said something I never knew. This is the front and this is the back no, of no, the no, same no. seal? This, this is the front and this is the back of the same seal. <laughs> okay, yeah. who knew that? Call me because I don't <laughs> think I'm going to get any more calls. So <laughs> this is such an education. I'm such a kindergartner. Uh, we all are compared to what Michael has learned. So he just told me that the eagle... I, I never thought of the eagle and the pyramid as two sides of a coin two sides as of, a seal. And, and the beauty no. of it is, John, when we use that term, two sides of the same coin, we are saying it has the same meaning. Right? It's the same thing, just two different expressions. And the expression could not be more true on the seal. It wasn't built so that you decide who got to receive the kickoff, apparently. <laughs> That's all I thought it was for, but look at that. So the eagle with the... Uh, with the arrows in his mouth and the peace, or the or arrows in his, his talon, his talon mm -hmm. and then the peace, uh, the, the which, branch. by the way, that's mm -hmm. an olive branch, isn't right. it? Yes, it oh is. Oh, my goodness. Uh -huh. yeah. And then he's got the Shekinah glory. How, it's very small. How many stars are those? Thirteen. I was going to say. Yeah. Just what a coincidence. Thirteen uh, rows on the pyramid on the other side. Well, and it's Ooh. part of a pattern of thirteens. So if, if you look at this, there's thirteen stars in the constellation, so one constellation, 13 stars, one in many, right? E pluribus unum, one out of many. Uh, 13 stripes on the shield, one shield. 13 arrows in the bunch, one cluster. 13 uh, rows on the pyramid, one pyramid. 13 letters in the phrase E pluribus unum. Oh my goodness. 13 letters in the phrase Anuit coeptus. You start to think these guys were smarter than we're giving them credit for because I am starting to think our country was founded by geniuses who had the hand of God on their shoulders. That's my conclusion. Man, mm -hmm. you can win party tricks if you want to pull this out of your hat and try to... <laughs> but this... The, the, and again, we get, to, we get to... Hopefully, I hope, I hope we can whet your uh, interest by having this conversation because uh, this... If you like American history um, or if you've been curious about... Was our country really founded on Christian principles, Judeo-Christian principles, or do you start to be persuaded because people are going to come out with a lot of misinformation about the Founding Fathers, and it's just going to get worse. Thomas Jefferson, for one, has been miscast historically in almost everything I've been taught, in my opinion, until David Barton, I think, his great new book called The Jefferson Lies. But this isn't so difficult because it's right on everybody's dollar bill. Absolutely. So you mm -hmm. can argue, well, maybe he said this and maybe he did, but you are unpacking something that we are still carrying around in our pockets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How brilliant. And, and really, you know, John, um, the things that I'm telling you, some of these things are, you know, well-known. Uh, like some of the, the arrows and the olive branch. The, 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 that the pyramid stands for virtue, it's the first time. You, your, your listeners haven't heard that before 
uh, other than from me probably, because it wasn't known before. It's discovered in the book, I mean, it, it, you know, in this process. And so they're going to read something new about the founding of our country. And, and there's also an, uh, something amazing to me, that the seal is not depicted accurately on the dollar bill. And so these things are significant for the meaning. And so as you unpack this and you start to see, wow, this is so powerful, this is something that's coming to light now, you know, you have to ask yourself, why? Why are we learning this now? And John, I believe it's because God is bringing this message for this time. It's His timing to reveal it, and it's for His purpose, and I think it's a, it's a significant one. It is an instruction. It is a set of instructions from the founders for the guardians of the republic, the American people, on what we need to do to protect and preserve this republic and pass it on to, to our children, like we've received it from our parents. And we are actually in danger of, of losing that republic. We, we seem to think that there's nothing that we can do that would destroy it. Oh, but that is not true. That if we do the things that are not supportive of virtue and providence and unity and freedom, that it will crumble mm -hmm. and we will lose it. And, and, and people tend to think, well, you know, you look at Venezuela and they say, well, if you want to see an example of socialism, look at Venezuela. And then they think, oh, no, that we won't be that kind of so socialism. Oh, let me tell you, there is no other kind. Not historically. Right. Uh, no other uh, socialist right. uh, government has worked. Right. So we, how are we so, you know, have such hubris that we think that we're going to do it different? It doesn't work that way. You don't control it. It controls you. And so if we do the things that, that are the basis of a socialist government, then we will have tyranny. We will have control. We will lose our freedoms and the, and the individual will not be valued, but it will be the masses and there will be a group that controls. That's just, that comes part and parcel. So here the founders are warning us. They're giving us this grace, this message, and they forged it in the furnace of the revolution. When this was written, it was coming out of the darkest days of uncertainty. This little ragtag group of colonists faced the superpower of the time. The result was not certain. We look back on it now and say, oh, well, you know, we, we won. You know, we knew they were going to win. Oh, no, we didn't. It was by no means certain. It was a grave risk that they took, and it was fearful, and many people died, and many people went to prison and lost houses and fortunes, okay? And so it was in the furnace of this revolution that they saw, and they communicated to us, and they put the message in there. And now here we are today, cracking open the time capsule and looking inside and seeing this message that's so critical for the Republic. And if we don't hear and listen and understand the message, we are at risk for losing the Republic. Amen. <laughs> I, I, I totally have been convicted in the last six months that uh, we have an opportunity in our day right now to return to the study of American history like has been ignored for the last 50 years is not being taught as, as I understand it and, and, and as it once was and you cannot trust anymore that your kids are going to be educated in the founding principles of this country, a government by the people for the people, you are not able to take for granted that you will understand that it's our heritage that broke the hereditary kingship heritage of all of Europe and the world. You will not understand that the founding principles of America are Judeo-Christian and that without Absolutely. adherence to those Christian principles, Judeo-Christian principles, this beautiful experiment with all its flaws, but it's the only nation that has fought to self-correct its own flaws, 
the only nation that went to war with itself over the scourge of something as evil as slavery. This, and so none of us would protect or pretend that we have you know, a, a, a blemishless history, but it is a unique and glorious history, and there's no more essential principles than those four pillars of freedom and God and virtue and unity upon which a society can be justly governed. And you can go back to Plato, you can go back to any government in the history of the world, and we're going to lose this if we can't go back and, and understand where we came from. This book is fantastic. Michael Canis, The Hidden Message of the Great Seal. It might sound like a niche topic, but I hope you've been listening because it's not a niche topic. It's the basis of liberty and freedom and the fact that they put it in metaphor, mm -hmm. in, in seal. I, I haven't read it. I, we had a chance to talk about it earlier today. I am fascinated. You, if you see this, this, isn't a, this is a book filled with... Uh, pictures and photographs and documents and tables and artwork and and it's absolutely beautiful in fact it, it's big too this book is what is that about 13 or 14 inches yeah, wide yeah 12 inches by 9 inches you, know, you should have so. made it 13 inches wide now you weren't <laughs> I you weren't to, but much I of fit a, it on the paper <laughs> yeah and if, in fact it's such a unique shape that you couldn't even find the, a publisher right. who would print it in this size so you've mm -hmm. self-published this book mm -hmm. it's beautiful it was printed by our holland's very own holland litho who yeah. are friends of ours yeah. How can we get this book? How can we order this book? There's a website. It's called hiddenmessage.org. And you can jump on there. There's a, a, a store. And uh, I'll tell you what. Um, I'll do something special. Um, I will uh, give a code that maybe you can put a tagline on this uh, recording. And uh, we'll decide what it's going to be. Why, why don't you tell me what the code is? Just write, make something up right now. How many letters does it have to be? And, and, any number you want. Liberty. Liberty. Okay, there L -I -B -E -R -T -Y. we go. L-I-B-E-R-T-Y. Okay, there will be a Liberty code. Great. And it'll be good for 20% off the, the price of the book. Wonderful. And it's got free shipping. You, uh, you're going to... You're going to owe it to yourself to spend... I'm going to owe it to myself as well to spend some time with this. The seal was written by the Thomas Jeffersons, Benjamin Franklin, and John Adams in 1776. If you want to get into their mindset... A mindset that changed the world. Um, Michael, you have done us all a great favor in doing this research. It blows me away that a normal person, I had on my, my podcast just this morning, Tim Mahoney, who has done, I think, world-class research into the Exodus and into Moses. And it's the kind of thing that I thought was being done at the great universities and the great think tanks. And it turns out it took a normal person, just a, a man with a passion and a hunger for the truth, to discover and, and spend his own time and treasure to give us what he gave us on Moses and on the Exodus. I, I feel, Mike, like you have done the same thing. I don't know why this wasn't done by uh, the Ivy League schools, why this wasn't, but this was your journey. You just had to dive in, and how long did you spend researching this? Five years. Yeah, Five, five, five thousand hours. <laughs> 5,000 nice, yeah. hours. Oh, thank you so much. Once again, Michael Canis is our guest. The book is called The Hidden Message of the Great Seal. The subtitle is How Foundational Truth from the Dawn of Liberty May Rescue a Republic in Peril. And the, and the website, once again, is www.thehiddenmessage.org. We've thrown out a 20% discount code today called Liberty. I hope people read this. I, I've told you, I, we are launching, uh, this isn't the launch moment right now when I'm going to present it, we are going to launch a slate of films that are going to explore topics like these mm -hmm. out of American history. I'm so excited about it. For one day when I get official and ready, we'll tell the world about it. America Studios, it's going to be a movement. This is exactly what we need today. Please, everybody, read Michael Canis' book. You'll be a better Americans for it. Teach your children, teach your parents. Thanks for being on the No Shame Podcast, uh, Thank Michael. you so much. I'm thrilled to have been here, John. Thank you for inviting me. No shame, no, we are not afraid. No shame on the gospel of his name. It's the power of God by which we all are saved. We need not be afraid. No shame, no, no, no shame on the gospel of his name. It's the power. Saved. We need not be afraid